Well, thanks for being here. Uh, I know this looks like a small group, but uh, we're very special because I know uh, it's we all have one thing in common, and that is we're all leaf lovers, right? So that's that's why we're here, and and for good reason. Because what we're going to do today is, as Dennis mentioned, we are going to uh, cover a prediction equation that we developed that can uh, take the nutrient profile of a ground sample of alfalfa and predict its leaf content with, uh, with high accuracy. We're going to start out talking a little bit about the implications of, uh, of, of leaves versus stems in alfalfa, uh, a lot about the development of the equation, and then lastly, how it can be applied uh, by growers and uh, dairy producers. I, I think everybody knows that, that um, leaves are a major factor affecting the quality of alfalfa, and in fact, uh, In our audience today, uh, Dr. Undersander at University of Wisconsin has studied this extensively, and what he's reported is that leaf percentage can account for 71% of the variation in the quality of alfalfa. And the major reason behind that is because there's a huge difference in the relative forage quality, or RFQ, between leaves and stems. And you'll see various numbers quoted, and I'm gonna show you some different ones, slightly different ones that we have from our lab. But uh, the important thing is, is that the RFQ value of stems is probably, of leaves, excuse me, is probably five to six times greater than what it is for stems. So if you lose leaves, you're gonna start losing forage quality and alfalfa quite quickly. And that's important for growers because they really do need to know what percent leaves are in their samples because uh, this will allow them to better manage the uh, growing and harvesting of their alfalfa. So the inspiration behind this whole effort for me <clears throat> relates back to some analysis that uh, we have performed in our laboratory uh, outside of St. Louis at Gray Summit, Missouri. So uh, obviously being an alfalfa company, we run lots of alfalfa analysis. And every so often we'll get a sample of alfalfa that looks like this. These are two actual alfalfa halage samples uh, that had been submitted and uh, run for crude protein, neutral detergent fiber digestibility, otherwise known as NDFD, relative forage quality, which is a calculated index, and then neutral detergent fiber. What's interesting about these samples is they, they both have a reasonably high crude protein. They have extremely high NDF digestibility. This one's actually based off of a 28-hour NDFD. So our lab average for that would probably be in the 42 to 43% range, so quite high. But as you can see, uh, these, these RFQ values uh, are extremely low. I mean, some people would actually say this would be dry cow hay. And the reason behind that is because the NDF percentage is so high. Normally, you would think for a sample like this, it probably should be in the upper 30s. Now, if that protein was a little bit lower, say down in the mid-teens in this uh, uh, NDF was up in the, uh, oh, let's say the low 50s, maybe even mid 50s. I would say that this sample was, had some grass contamination in it. It was probably an alfalfa grass mix. But what we found out upon further analysis is really what it suffered from was just leaf loss. It had a very low leaf percentage. Here in a moment, uh, whoops, we're going to uh, talk about the fact that standing alfalfa will typically have an average leaf percent of about 50%. So this has lost a considerable amount of leaves somewhere along its life, either in the field or during harvest. So again, Dr. Undersander has uh, explored the differences between leaves and stems in quite detail and has published results from that. And again, uh, we're gonna show you some data from our lab on this as well, but uh, suffice to say that the difference between crude protein and leaves and stems is quite large, being much higher for leaves than it is for stems. Uh, furthermore, conversely, you'll see that stems are much higher in NDF than they are uh, in leaves. And the same effect has on, on fiber carbohydrate. That's what really drives then this big difference in relative forage quality. Now, any time that I see differences this big, what that tells me is that there's an opportunity to use these big differences in nutrient profiles to develop equations to be able to predict these two components. 
And that, you know, that's not just for leaves and stems and alfalfa. You can do that in lots of things. So I always like to say that uh, for those of you that have done experiments in maybe your graduate programs, you know, variation is always your enemy. You're always trying to control variation when you're running experiments. But when you're trying to develop prediction equation, variation is actually your friend because the more variation you can create, you can actually leverage that in order to develop these prediction equations. And that's exactly what we did uh, in, these, in this whole effort. The one thing, however, that I was also interested in is what kind of differences would we see in NDF digestibility in ash, which uh, Dr. Undersander hadn't reported here. So what we actually did this last summer was we collected uh, standing alfalfa samples at our West Salem, Wisconsin research facility. And uh, we took uh, 12 varieties that had been cut at three different harvesting schedules, 28, 33, and 38 days. So we got 36 samples. Uh, we obtained 100 grams of samples of each one of those. We dried them down at a fairly cool temperature so we didn't damage the NDF digestibility because that's one of the things we wanted to look at. And then after drying, we hand separated the leaves from the stems, weighed those two fractions so that we could know what percent leaves were in those samples. <clears throat> now, we didn't, away, or we didn't dry them down to absolute dry matter, but they were similar dry matter, so at least we knew that, uh, what the percentages were. After those samples were ground at uh, one millimeter grind size, we analyzed them for all these nutrient components that eventually we're gonna use to build this prediction equation. And that included dry matter, ash protein, Again, neutral detergent fiber, neutral detergent fiber digestibility. All of these came out of what we call the Calibrate High Quality Forage Analysis Test. And this was done at our Forage Genetics Digestibility Lab at Gray Summit, Missouri, which is outside of St. Louis. So what we found from that was very similar to what Dr. Undersander had found, and that is there's this big difference between crude protein between leaves and stems being about 30% versus about 12% on stems. Big difference in NDF content, in fact, a very large difference, about 60% in stems, about 20% in NDF. So this is looking real promising because big differences allows us a greater opportunity to build prediction equations out of this. What's also interesting, though, is there was a lesser difference in ash content, but there was some difference, and interestingly enough, the ash content of leaves is higher than it is for stems. The NDF digestibility, surprisingly, why it was greater for leaves than it was for stems, like you would anticipate, the difference wasn't nearly as large as I thought it would be. Uh, consequently, remember this difference being lesser in ash in NDFD because that's going to be a little bit more uh, interesting once we get into the prediction equation. And of course, what this ended up in was, as Dr. Undersander had found, big difference between the RFQ in leaves and stems, maybe not as large as what he had seen, but we're still seeing about a 5x or five times greater RFQ for leaves. Other interesting thing in this particular data set, when you look at the standard deviation, which is a, a measure of the variation amongst those 36 samples, in no case did the standard deviation exceed 10% of the mean. And I would have thought that maybe the composition of leaves and stems within a plant would actually change, or across plants would actually change more than that. But Dan's shaking his head. It really is pretty standard. So, you know, leaves and stems are a fairly known commodity you know, regardless of, of you know, where it's grown and in, in, uh, maybe even variety. So if we go back two years to 2019, this is when we started collecting samples then to take all this information to develop a prediction equation. So during the summer of 2019, we took 160 samples of alfalfa that we collected from FGI research stations at Wisconsin, Idaho, and California. Because again, we're looking for variation. We wanted to see samples of alfalfa that had big differences in, in NDF content, big differences in leaf content, differences in protein, so we could develop a really robust equation. So to do that, across those stations, we had 43 alfalfa varieties, three cuttings, first, second, and third over four different cutting schedules, being anywhere from 28 to 38 days. Now, before anybody asks a question at the end of the, of the uh, presentation about what influence did all of these have on leaf percent, I can't tell you. 
because these samples were all collected from ongoing research trials. They were not collected in a balanced way across all of these locations, so I really can't pull out their main effects. Again, I was just looking for variation so we could develop this prediction equation. Again, like we had done before, we dried them at a fairly low temperature. We stripped the hand stripped the leaves from the stems. We weighed them, recombined them, ground them over one millimeter screen, and then analyzed them again for dry matter, ash, protein, NDF, NDFD at our lab at Gray Summit. <clears throat> so then we started comparing those leaf percentages that we, we've measured by stripping the leaves from the stems with their nutrient profiles in a process they call stepwise regression analysis. Now that's not real important, but what it means is we start building prediction models based off what's the best one nutrient model, you know, one nutrient containing model, two nutrient, three and four, okay? And what we found out from that process was NDF, crude protein, NDFD, and ASH were all significant terms. They all did a, were all contributing to our ability to predict leaves just from these nutrient profiles in a ground up sample of alfalfa. Subsequently, we found that ASH contributed very little to the prediction equation and we just dropped it from the equation. <clears throat> and the major reason I did that was because of potential soil contamination. Shouldn't have really anything to do with leaves. It's kind of a wild card. NIR really doesn't pick it up directly anyway, so we just left it out. And we're gonna talk more about that equation here in just a minute. So the resulting prediction equation explained 84% of the variation leaf percentage in the 160 samples. And that's all I'm gonna talk about that equation right now because nobody should ever use a prediction equation to validate it. So that's what we did the next, the next year. We picked out in 2020 40 brand new samples from two of those research centers. It was the one in West Salem, Wisconsin, the other one in Davis, California. Did the same thing. We dried them, stripped the leaves, weighed them, figured out what the percentage was, recombined them, ground them to over a one millimeter screen, analyzed for all those nutrient profiles. But this time what we did was we put them through that prediction equation that we had developed in 2019. So here's a completely independent set of data put through that equation. And what you're looking at is how good a job did it actually do in predicting what we measured in a totally different set of samples. <clears throat> and this is what we, we discovered. So what's plotted here is the predicted percentage of leaves in those 40 samples versus what was actually measured. And I plotted it here so that we could look at some statistics. Now, the first thing you'll know is that it you know, kind of would have been nice if these samples had been distributed across the spectrum of leaf percent. But again, I was just grabbing samples from ongoing experiments. The luck of the draw was is we got them at each extreme of the distribution. Now, that's what drove this high R squared value, so you can pretty well ignore that. But what is nice is that when most prediction equations fail, they fail at the extreme of your sample range. These actually perform pretty well at the extreme, so much so that the standard error of the prediction was 2.8. Now, what that means is that 2.8 is on average how much it is off. So it's off by 2.8 percentage units of leaves. That's the difference between each one of these predicted points and what its actual value was, okay? Now, that probably doesn't mean much to you, but typically when you're trying to predict a fixed value like protein or NDF, and in this case, leaves, you should be able to do as good as about 5% of the mean. And as I'm gonna show you in a minute, the mean percentage of leaves in alfalfa is typically about 50%. So 5% of that's 2.5% leaves. We got down to 2.8. This equation's about as good as you can expect, all right, as far as its error. However, it did have a bias of 3.2, and what that means is it was over predicting by 3.2 percentage units of leaves. So here, when it was actually 50% leaves uh, observed, or 45, 50% uh, leaves observed, it was actually predicting about 53. 
So we needed to fix that, so what we did was we took these samples, we threw it into the 160 that we had from the previous year, reparametized our prediction equation, and we came up with what we call LEAF, leaves enhance alfalfa forage. So now we have 200 samples, and what it does is it predicts leaves and alfalfa in a ground sample, strictly from its neutral detergent fiber, protein, and uh, NDF digestibility measure in that ground sample. Here's what the statistics look like. So here's the predicted values, here's the measured values, the R squared value is 84. So it's explaining 84% of uh, the ability to predict leaves. The other 16% is coming from something else. Um, and the nice thing is we got rid of the bias because that line right there is the best fit line and it lines on the, or lays on the line of unity. So now 60% measured is 60% predicted and the standard error of the prediction is still 2.8. So I've spent a lot of time basically indicating to you that um, when you get this on a lab report, it's, it's had a lot of work put into it and it's pretty doggone accurate when you consider it's just a ground sample of alfalfa that you're using to predict it. So now that we've got this prediction equation, what we thought we'd do is let's go in and see what we can do with commercially available alfalfa samples in the marketplace and, and what does it mean? You know, what, what can we do with this equation? What do we do with the numbers? So we grabbed 360 samples that had come through our lab from across the United States in 2019. They were analyzed at our, our lab, like I said, at Gray Summit. Had a wide range in quality. They varied in NDF content from 16 to 67 percent. That's pretty wide range for alfalfa. Crude protein, 8 to 30, NDFD from 34 to 62, and the calculated leaf percent was 10 to 77 percent. That's about as wide as you can anticipate for alfalfa. And here's what that distribution looked like. These are number of samples for that 360 sample set, which are representative of really a fairly broad spectrum of commercial samples from 2019. This is a, same, a similar distribution chart from the original 200 calibration samples. The average from the calibration sample was 52% leaves. From the uh, samples from uh, the field from 2019, it was 48. So typically standing alfalfa based off this data has about 50% leaves. Now that's before you cut it down and start hassling with it, right? It's 50%. Standard deviation is about 10%. What that means is that typically the mean plus or minus one standard deviation is two-thirds of the population. So if you want to know what typical alfalfa look like, it would be 50 plus or minus 10, 40 to 60 percent leaves based off this data. Now, you know, is it going to look like that every year? I don't know. But for, you know, for these sets of samples, it's probably a pretty good starting point. So the next thing I did was I took that sample from 2019 that, that sample set from 2019, checking my time here. I put it through the RFQ equation, which again, Dr. Undersander helped develop years ago. And I plotted it against the percent leaves. And what you'll see is that it's a curvilinear, it's actually an exponential relationship, which means the more leaves you pursue, you are preserve in your hay or silage, the bigger payback you get on RFQ. That's a pretty good thing, all right? So then I developed this equation and I back calculated what the RFQ would be for different percentages of leaves over this range that we said was typical for alfalfa, 40 to 60%. So what you'll see is that, you know, for 50% alfalfa from this set of data, RFQ is 172. That's pretty typical to, you know, Randy Welch, what people would say was around a 180, you know, for, for a typical good alfalfa. But at the low end at 40%, 132, at the high end of 60% leaves 224. Seems pretty reasonable. What I was really interested in, however, is what effect does the rate of change in leaves have on forage quality as we measure it using RFQ. So I did that by measuring the slope of that line between 40 and 60%. It's slightly curved, but I did linear, 
And what you get is that a one percentage unit change in leaves equates to 4.6 units of RFQ. And that's pretty big. And what it says is, is that you don't have to lose very many leaves before you can turn really good standing alfalfa hay into dry cow hay pretty quickly, okay? So once we knew this, and Dan and I had been communicating back and forth, and, and Dan says, well, you know, I wonder what this means financially. And I said, well, I don't know, I guess there's a number of ways you can look at it. So Dan, being the inquisitive fellow that he is, got out a spreadsheet and he started sending me stuff, right? And then I'd send stuff back. So what Dan did was he, he developed a model, and I hope you don't mind me sharing this, Dan. But uh, based off of the tonnage loss, because I think everybody realizes that, you know, you do lose tons when you lose leaves. So let's say if the standing alfalfa is 50% leaves, and by the time you got it into a bale of hay, it's only 45% leaves, you lost five percentage units. If you usually yield about four tons of alfalfa per acre per year on that field, you've lost two-tenths of a ton. That's 400 pounds. Now, that may not seem like a lot, but, uh, you know, for those of us that can remember uh, what Richard Harris said in MacArthur Park, you know, if you leave the cake out in the rain, what are you going to lose? You lose the icing, right? And the leaves is the icing on the cake. That's what ran off. So it has a really disproportionate damaging effect on the alfalfa, those 400 pounds of leaves that you lost. That was so, but you have a tonnage loss. You have a crude protein differential loss because as we saw in all these graphs, there's 35% protein in the leaves versus the average of about 20 for the whole crop. But more importantly, there's this quality loss in RFQ because you know, we said that there was this 4.6 unit de decrease in leaves for every 1% that you lose in, um, in leaves. There was 4.6 unit loss in RFQ. And if you assume about a $1 discount per RFQ unit, that's about a $4.6 loss per ton of hay from one percentage unit loss in leaves, which says that of the $7 per ton per unit loss that Dan calculated up, the vast majority of it is quality loss. It's the RFQ loss. And that's because if you remember that, that previous graph, as the leaves increase, the RFQ goes up in an exponential way. So that's why you can lose value on hay pretty quickly uh, with leaf loss. So at this point, I wanted to recognize uh, work that Randy Welch and his team have done uh, with Winfield over, gosh, Randy, the last four years. Randy's had a passion for uh, tracking leaves in, in very creative ways from the time that it's been standing until the time that it's ended up at a harvested state, and uh, these losses can vary considerably depending upon the way it's done, obviously, and, and where it's going to end up. And from that, uh, that's helped develop some, some goals that you can try to uh, shoot for when you're looking at these values that are generated by this equation. So we talked about 50% you know, is what you would expect on average when it's standing in the field. Well, you can't really expect that to be what you should expect in a bale or a bunker because you're going to have some losses during harvest. Five percentage units is not unusual. So if you've got greater than 45% leaves in a sample of a baled hay or in a bunker of silage, that's probably okay. You probably don't need to take any action. You're going to lose some leaves. You probably can't help it. If it's getting down to 40% leaves in that sample, uh, you probably have had some leaf loss occur that you probably can do something about. There's probably room for improvement. And then lastly, you know, if it's less than 40%, you've got some significant leaf loss. You probably need to uh, contact your agronomist and really talk about some things that you can do to prevent that leaf loss. Because at this point, if you've got some elite genetics in that field and you've done a really good job of, of planting that crop and nursing it along and you've got 10, you know, this is 10 percentage units, 
which is 20% leaf loss, uh, it's probably going to look bad on a lab report. And you've all that hard work is basically left on the ground in the field. So what can you do? And this is a better topic for Dan to cover than me, so I'm going to go through it really fast. Uh, things like fungicide application, uh, particularly in, in periods of time when uh, it's very humid. Uh, disease pest resistant varieties is another good way to try to abate it because unfortunately any stress that's put on the alfalfa plant usually results in loss of leaves. <clears throat> and then finally, the biggest one of all is probably harvest management. And Dan, I don't know what the biggest part of that is, but I'd say it's probably uh, turning windrows when they're, when they're too dry, less than 40% moisture. You're gonna have a lot of leaf loss. I did wanna spend just at the end here, just a couple of quick uh, comments for people who, uh, who like to measure things like this in the commercial lab world. And this is a little bit more information about that equation. As I mentioned, the significant terms in that equation were NDF crude protein, NDF DNA ash. The component that was the most descriptive in that equation, and it had the highest sum of squares, which is a statistical term, is NDF and it's a negative coefficient. And that makes sense because stems had a higher NDF content than leaves did, all right? Next in order was crude protein. It has a positive coefficient. It had an intermediate sum of squares, so it was the next most important coefficient in that equation. And then lastly was NDFD, and interestingly enough, it's a negative coefficient. Sometimes these uh, empirical equations will fool you. Ash contributed very little, and we left it out. So somebody could say, well, why don't we just use NDF as a way to predict leaf percent in alfalfa? And the reason I wouldn't do it is because of this. Including crude protein and NDFD will help the improve the detection of samples containing foreign material, which in alfalfa case is gonna be grasses and weeds. So this equation probably should not be used in samples that have grass in them. And it's for two major reasons. One is it wasn't developed with any samples that had grass in them. It wasn't validated with any samples that had grass in it. Thirdly, I don't think you can interpret the results. And the reason why is because if you have a sample of alfalfa that's got 20%, let's say I had a sample and you got 30% leaves in it, and you know there's grass in it. Let's say it's got 20% grass, so it's 80% alfalfa, so it's 40% leaves on average, so a 30% leaf percent, that's a good value. But let's say unknown to you, it's got 50% grass in it. It's only 50% alfalfa, which means it's 25% leaves. 30% leaves is a good value. So you can't really interpret it. So it's not only unreliable, it's uninterpretable. If you got grass in the samples, don't use this particular equation. Lastly is the fact that um, nutrient values used in this equation came from the Calibrate HQ test. Um, consequently, uh, there's no reason to believe that this equation would have validity with values that came from any other lab test or any other values of NDF crude protein and NDF from other labs. And here's an example. <clears throat> These are two actual samples of alfalfa. This one's called Rounds Third. This one's Big Square Hay 2021. These are the values that came from the Calibrate test, and that's the leaf percentage that resulted from it. This came from another commercial lab. These were their inputs, and it predicted a leaf percent that was eight units lower. Nothing wrong with these values. It's a lab bias issue, but it does have a fairly substantial effect on the resulting leaf percent. However, in this case, when you compare this different sample, it was only off by two, so you just never know. So how do you get access to this? Submit your samples to a licensed lab for the Calibrate HQ analysis. These are the labs that are currently offering it today. Uh, if you have any questions, however, you can contact info at calibratetechnologies.com and they can provide you some more information. So, in summary, leaf uh, test is a predictive equation to help determine leaf percentage of alfalfa in a ground sample. It can help growers make management and agronomic decisions on their operations. Leaf percentage can account for 71 to 88% of the variation in forage quality, making it very important. 
Uh, leaves have a relative forage quality on average of about 440, whereas stems are around 80. Typically alfalfa has a 50-50 ratio of leaves to stems. Ideally, you should have at least 45% in your sample. If you're falling down to that 40 to 45% range, there's room for improvement. If it falls below 40, you've had significant loss, you probably need to do something about it. And uh, not only could leaf loss account for changes in quality, but can impact, impact your overall yield. With that, I, I appreciate all your time, and uh, I'm available for questions. And it is warm in this room. Uh, you've, you're to be congratulated for uh, staying. <laughs> Yeah, so Dan was asking um, <clears throat> if we had any idea what the uh, variation would be in the genetics, uh, across genetics, or across varieties, right? Yeah, and, and again, our data set was unbalanced. I didn't look at it <clears throat> because I thought it would become interesting and I might be biased. <laughs> but um, the nice thing is, now with this tool, people can actually go and, and look at that and see, we are, we're gonna start incorporating this and following it in our breeding program. I don't know if, you know, it's not necessarily a target, but it's just something we'll follow and, and we'll see. Because I, I don't know if anybody knows what the heritability of leaf percentage is. Um, I don't know if it's high or low, but uh, it's probably something, it's obviously something that's worth paying attention to. Yeah, Dan. We didn't do a clear test of all varieties, but I have worked with a bunch of varieties, and there isn't much difference among the commercial entries. You can get extremes on both sides, drought stress samples, things like that, but under normal growing conditions, that 45 to 55 is a pretty good number at the bud stage, which is one thing that he left off. As it matures, you'll have some leaf loss. Excuse the interruption. Okay. You know, I appreciate that. That's what happened when you have a ruminant nutritionist give a, a talk about plants. Yeah. Sure. A calibrate equation using that versus a commercial lab equation. What if you use commercial lab on both? You know, consistently use the same lab. Would that make? Would you be able to predict at least the, the range of variation? Right, yeah so, yeah, so if a lab were to go through the same process, they should be able to develop an equation that's just as accurate. And, and that's one reason, you know, if, if, they, if, if a lab would want to do that, uh, you know, we have said that this methodology will work. It's a lot of work. I never thought that stripping 200 samples of alfalfa <laughs> would be that much work. It's a lot of work to do. Yeah, that's yeah. That's what students and interns yeah, are for, right? That's right. <laughs> but uh, the only thing uh, I think that's probably pretty important is the, predict the NIR prediction equations that you, you uh, need to predict the import inputs also have to be extremely accurate. So if anybody does do it, uh, my recommendation for the sake of the alfalfa industry would be to try to get those standard error or the predictions as close to two and a half as you can and, and keep monitoring and make sure to keep it there because it's obvious if it gets very much if it gets larger than that knowing how important one percentage unit error could be uh, it's probably not going to mean anything anymore and, and what we were trying to do is develop a test that was reliable enough that the industry would want to use it and take the time to stick with it to try to do a better job and uh, you know further improve the you know the reputation of alfalfa in the marketplace but but that pro the process does work and um, uh, it's but it's a lot of work I think we better cut it off there um, I can attest to how much work that is I, I for my PhD I separated out uh, samples uh, I think there were 64 plots times three, uh, five times a year times four years yeah it, it's a lot of work I can tell you and I appreciate you all working on this I, it's a great innovation
And, and I, I do have to point out, uh, I have to give you my USDA statement here. Uh, the mention of a product or a company does not imply a, uh, a favoritism or recommendation of that product. Uh, but we thought that this equation, this uh, innovation was significant and something of, uh, to bring forward to, to everyone's attention. It's got some major uh, nutrition implications, but also especially agronomy implications and management, uh, how we manage the, our crop as we take it out of the field, and, and also even things like uh, fungicides, uh, trying to protect those leaves and, and making sure that we retain as much of that leaf material as possible. So, uh, Dave, really appreciate you coming up today. Let's show uh, Dr. Weekly our appreciation for a great presentation.